Located at the tip of the valley-covered San Francisco Peninsula, bound by the Pacific Ocean to the west and the San Francisco Bay to the east, the city of San Francisco enjoys one of the most beautiful settings imaginable. It is easy to get to know San Francisco because many of the neighborhoods and sites are in close proximity to each other and can even be reached on foot. With a population of over 7 million, the San Francisco Bay Area is one of the largest metropolitan areas in the U.S. The city, well known for its many hills, oftentimes makes drivers prove their skills, as the abrupt hills do present a challenge, with steep Lombard Street being a good example. San Francisco enjoys a temperate climate that is generally mild all year round. The temperature rarely climbs higher than the mid-70s and rarely falls below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The month of July is both the hottest and driest month. While the city usually has an azure blue sky in September and October, Astride the San Andreas Fault, the city, as Californians call it, is subject to frequent earthquakes. San Francisco is an important hub of trade and finance between the United States and countries in the Pacific region. In the 1980s, the economic expansion of the Asian dragons, such as China, Japan, and Korea, helped to reinforce San Francisco's financial importance. But the city's main source of revenue continues to be tourism. San Francisco is the most visited city in the country, and each year welcomes another 15 million visitors. Once you begin to explore this city, it's easy to understand why it is so beloved by tourists. It is very beautiful. You know, San Francisco is such a beautiful city, it is a romantic city, and it is a city that offers several great views. So right now, we're going to do a tour in this cafe in honor of the great Italian composer from the 19th century, Puccini. There are many of these little cafes in the Italian neighborhood of North Beach. Often family-run, they offer a friendly environment. Cafe Puccini is one of the most typical of cafes in the neighborhood. The people speak Italian as well as English, and people go there just as often to read as to meet up with friends. Dedicated to the great Puccini, the cafe is decorated with posters of the Italian composer's operas. Take note that the jukebox found in this place only offers opera selections. The clientele is made up of regulars and the equally numerous tourists who are attracted by the promise of an excursion into Italian culture. It's hard to be more Italian. Although San Francisco's Italian-American population is currently dispersed throughout the city, North Beach preserves numerous traces of the early Italian heritage. Built in 1860, the first Catholic church constructed after the era of the Spanish missions was St. Francis of Assisi Church. This landmark church is located in the heart of the Italian neighborhood. Finding their inspiration in Italian wine and espressos, several writers and poets at the beginning of the beat movement adopted Vesuvio, a bar covered in graffiti, as their most favorite hangout. Vesuvio was opened in 1949 and displays the works of local artists. This was the place to meet up for beatnik writers, one of whom was the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas. Recognizing what the beat generation contributed to the city, San Francisco renamed the adjacent side street Jack Kuriak Street in honor of the author of On the Road, written in this city and which continues to be considered one of the masterpieces of beat literature.
The painter and poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti was one of the founders of City Lights in 1953. City Lights made itself well known by publishing the first works of beatnik authors, briefly making North Beach the literary epicenter of the country. Nowadays, City Lights is still an excellent bookstore, and it is the perfect place to find any piece about the main features of the beatnik movement. It is also a bookstore that likes to take risks regarding the titles it offers. And it is also a place that inspires a love of reading. Regarding the Condor Club, there's a plaque on the exterior wall of this den, an establishment that's been open for around 60 years, that commemorates the achievement of offering the first full striptease entertainment in the United States. The filmmaker Francis Ford Coppola, he has opted to buy a property that houses his American Zeotrope film studio. Some very great filmmakers have worked in this studio, George Lucas, for example, or Coppola himself. The movies Apocalypse Now and The Godfather 1 and 2 had their soundtracks worked on at this place. The restaurant is also Coppola's property. Coppola has also become a winemaker. The actual separation between Chinatown and North Beach is sometimes fuzzy, but suffice it to say that Italians of North Beach are neighbors to the Asians in Chinatown. With its multitude of restaurants, shops, and stalls with unusual merchandise, this neighborhood known as Chinatown suddenly plunges us into another world. A population estimated beyond 70,000 is contained within a small area, representing one of the most important Asian communities outside of Asia. Lanterns decorated in a variety of different ways light Grant Avenue, the famous tourist artery in Chinatown. You might find it helpful that all of the street names are displayed in English and Chinese. You don't have to stroll far from Grant Avenue to discover the small side streets lined with stalls offering an assortment of merchandise because Chinatown is a place of intense commercial activity. In the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood, one finds magnificent Victorian houses in pastel colors that are impeccably groomed. To stroll through this neighborhood is to have the impression of living in an enclave, a neighborhood that evolves according to its own rules, away from noise and stress. It is astounding to realize that these beautiful houses of San Francisco served as a background for a movement that literally took America by surprise. In the U.S. and in the world, the 1960s and 70s were an era of protest, dissent, especially prevalent on university campuses. In the summer of 67, the whole world came to know that something new was happening in San Francisco. Young people with psychedelic clothing, long hair, many of whom had discovered LSD and free love, invaded Haight-Ashbury. It was the start of the hippie lifestyle in San Francisco. Trends definitely start here, and you will still find the presence of hippie culture today. The hippie invasion saw its peak during the famous Summer of Love in 1967. It was a time of intentional provocation, oftentimes seen as baffling. A breeding ground of counterculture, the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood still carries the gene for protest through action. In the 1960s, many beatniks, fringe artists, and students moved into this neighborhood, encouraged by the affordable housing. 
LSD, a drug that was legal until 1966, circulated freely, and the residents of the neighborhood were known to have made generous use of it. Today, the neighborhood is still strongly influenced by hippie culture, and the neighborhood has been able to maintain its provocative taste and its penchant for originality. Their neighbors in the Castro neighborhood are mostly gay people. Castro Street is now a central place in the history of San Francisco. On this street and the surrounding area, you find bars and restaurants that have decided to no longer hide their clientele in dark rooms by installing big picture windows and by adorning their windows with rainbow flags, the symbol of gay pride. 35 years ago, society often talked about it as a social revolution. Today, the neighborhood has become an important element of San Francisco's culture and a mainstream tourist attraction of this California city. A collection of European-style architecture reigns at the heart of San Francisco's government, artistic and musical life, dominated by City Hall, whose copper dome is visible from most of the city's other neighborhoods. It's possible to take a visit to this building, which has been devoted to the city's government since 1915. The War Memorial Opera House was built close behind City Hall, this opera house reproduces the layout of a Paris opera house. You'll need great connections if you're interested in getting tickets. Not far from there, the Louise Davies Symphony Hall is the home of the San Francisco Symphony. This building, remarkable as far as the impression it gives at a first glance, is a glass and granite complex that was completed in 1981. Finally, the Asian Art Museum is another highlight of a visit to this neighborhood. With the recognized importance of San Francisco's Asian community, you can imagine the popularity of its exhibitions. San Francisco reveals its multiple faces, especially true when you take the time to explore its neighborhoods on foot. San Francisco is a city that offers a lot as far as shows and cultural expressions go. For example, Chinese New Year, at the end of February or the beginning of March, depending on the lunar calendar, is a major cultural event. The dragons, firecrackers, and parades attract thousands of spectators. This is definitely one of the city's classic events. Every year, participants compete for originality while ensuring that the event is authentic because after all, San Francisco has one of the most important Asian communities anywhere. We know what we're talking about here, the Jazz and Blues Festival, which takes place in September. Includes musicians from around the world performing both outdoor and indoor shows. San Francisco, a city where rock is usually king, makes room for the warm rhythms of blues and jazz with this festival. San Francisco's fireworks show on Independence Day is famous and worth watching, an important event. Many people will prefer to stroll through Soma, a welcoming public plaza and a place where many art galleries are located. Or you can again get a taste of luxury at the prestigious stores found in the financial district. It's also in this neighborhood that you find the most elegant hotels in the city. On a beautiful sunny day, crowds and lots of energy are guaranteed. Being right next to the Pacific Ocean assures that the city experiences frequent and varied weather changes. Being next to the Pacific also fosters visits from marine animals, which over time have become regulars at the harbor. At Seal Rock, right in the middle of the touristy part of this harbor, there is a surprising colony of sea lions. 
These are wild animals that are free to come and go, but they have really adopted Fisherman's Wharf as home. This part of the harbor, as its name indicates, is the place where San Francisco's fishermen have embarked for decades. The fishing industry played a major role in San Francisco's 20th century development. Today, you can still appreciate the product of this catch by tasting the fish and seafood at this place. The crab is particularly popular here. However, Fisherman's Wharf offers a lot more than just its fish and seafood. This place has become a public mingling location and a focal point for tourists that visit San Francisco. You will find the great variety of regular commercial activity here that is popularly known as a tourist trap, but yet a particularly vibrant area on any beautiful day. Also in this district, it's a pleasing experience to go by the old Del Monte Company Cannery. This is a great example of the preservation of the city's historical heritage, while also being a highly successful reuse of a building. Every day, one can stop by there and appreciate the talent of a local musician in a very pleasant environment. Continuing our walk, we will cross a shipping dock to get to one of the famous cable cars. There is also a constant air of energy in this area. There are many street musicians in this city. We will come back later to the cable cars because we want to have you explore the pleasures of the San Francisco Bay. You must admit that there are a lot of other places with a worse living environment. San Franciscans take advantage of this quality of life by making use of walking paths and the bay's water. These are truly typical images of a beautiful weekend day in San Francisco. And as your outing continues towards the wharf, you're offered to an unobstructed view of the Golden Gate and of the many sailboats. You can calmly observe rowers in the middle of their training or simply admire the natural beauty of the San Francisco Bay. You can also fish from the wharf, an activity you can do for free. Here you'll find enthusiasts of a mode of transportation that is not that widespread, but that is fun and different. A little bit like this other way of exploring the city. It doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you do it. While San Francisco is its heart, the whole region is worth visiting. We're here an hour and a half to the northeast of San Francisco in the beautiful city of Sacramento, a city that has always suffered a little living in San Francisco's or Los Angeles's shadow. However, it has played a big role in the development of the country, and in particular of California. In fact, during the time of the Union Pacific Railroad, it was here that railroad work was started in the west to ultimately connect to the east. It was also from here that Wells Fargo formed its iconic Pony Express and stagecoach service. Sacramento is also the port of entry to the Northwest and to California for an important historic event in the development of this geography. The Gold Rush, a sweet madness that swept the region. Sacramento, 80 minutes east of San Francisco, still serves as evidence of this era now many years later. To walk through the streets of Sacramento is to take in the atmosphere of the era. You literally plunge into the past. A visit to the Wells Fargo Museum sets the tone for the exploration to come. Nothing amazing, but the history of this company, illustrated through images, is somewhat like seeing the step in the development of the West. Sacramento receives around 5 million visitors annually. Tourists in search of history and nostalgia pour into this city, a city also well known for its tranquility and cleanliness. For Northern Californians, Sacramento is a good choice for a place to spend a pleasant day with the family. 
and the city has also been named the best place for romantic encounters. The city developed around the Sacramento River, which at times resembles the city of New Orleans. Well, a little. The paddle steamers only serve to enhance this feeling. This one here now serves as a hotel, an interesting way to stay overnight in the area. The wooden sidewalks of Old Sacramento really give the city the look of a pioneer city. Several shops and restaurants provide a good backdrop for your visit to these places. Sacramento is also about the history of the famous Pony Express, and above all about the trains of different western companies that contributed to building the Transcontinental Railroad. You can feel the role the railroads played as an engine of the economy and the development of the West everywhere in Old Town. This place serves as a museum as well as an excellent train station where numerous locomotives and train cars still serve as evidence of the great feats of the time. Guided visits are offered, but you might consider simply spending an afternoon strolling about and taking in this place at your own pace. Sacramento is the capital of California, so consider taking a quick tour of the California State Capitol. It's a beautiful building. The sequoia is the tallest tree among all flora, able to grow to more than 300 feet tall, and it is only found in a small section of territory from the north of British Columbia to California and up to Oregon, where the climatic conditions and the environmental humidity suit it marvelously. Muir Woods National Monument is located a mere 12 miles or so to the north of the Golden Gate Bridge, Visitors will surely be impressed by the height of these trees, even though this forest may not even be the home of the tallest specimens. The advantage that visitors have is surely due to this park's proximity to the city of San Francisco. Impressive nature, pleasant hiking paths, a breath of fresh air, and all this just minutes from the heart of the city. The immediate neighbor of this healthy little forest is Mount Tamalpais. From the top of its 2,500-foot elevation, this mountain offers a fantastic view of San Francisco and its bay, visible in the distance. This area will allow you to appreciate the region's geography and the point to which San Francisco is a city that constantly flirts with the sea. So if you return to the city at the beginning of the evening, you will see San Francisco take on a new face. You will see the city bathed in a sweet ambiance that lets you know that it will be a pleasant evening. San Francisco is beautiful day and night. Located about 15 miles to the north of San Francisco, the city of Berkeley is best known for its university campus that has educated students from all states in the nation since the 1960s and leaves its imprint on the entire community. The college campus is open to the public and offers the opportunity to take charming walks alongside buildings that are remarkable for their aesthetic and architectural qualities. The free speech movement started at this university in 1964. The university was also at the origin of massive protests against the Vietnam War that would eventually engulf the entire country. Sather Tower, also known as the Campanile, rises at the heart of the campus, and it has become a symbol of the city. The architect John Gallo Howard, who arrived in Berkeley in 1901, is behind this structure. We also owe Sather Gate, the arched gate at the northern entrance to the university, to this architect. Telegraph Avenue, which leads to the university, is the street most used by students. The street is always lively there. It is an interesting street colored by a motley crowd. A little to the south, on Shattuck, you will find Chez Panisse Restaurant, which is considered to be the establishment where what culinary critics call California cuisine as born in the 1970s. Expect to pay a hefty sum for a meal for two at this restaurant. Still, there are many other options in the area. All in all, you will spend a very pleasant day with beautiful weather in this elegant city of Berkeley.
The opportunities are numerous, and it's always been like that. Almost everyone here can calmly enjoy the beauty of the bay, the bay that is literally an aquatic park for fishing, swimming, kayaking, and sailing. When I say that almost everyone has always been able to enjoy this beauty, imagine that there was even one of the most famous prisons in the world here. Certainly one of the most famous in the United States, just a few hundred fathoms from the city of San Francisco. Imagine yourself walled in like that, at the bottom with a stone wall always keeping you captive while you can hear the noise of picnics, fairs, music coming from the city. That's what it was like to be incarcerated in Alcatraz prison. Less than two miles from Fisherman's Wharf and visible from any high part of the city or from the road along the docks, Alcatraz Island seems to be close and far all at the same time. That is the place that had a reputation for being the strictest prison in the country. From Fisherman's Wharf, you can get to the island by boat in 15 minutes. It's clear that with the path before us, we're ready to have a unique experience. The approach to the island seems intimidating. A fortress, a place to avoid in normal times. Setting foot in the island today, you still get a feeling of unease. It's as if you feel like you're being observed and you don't know if it's the criminals or the guards observing you. Because of its particularly severe prison conditions, Alcatraz became more of a place of punishment than of rehabilitation. There was one guard for every three prisoners and work was considered a privilege granted only for good behavior. 20% of the prisoners never received a visitor during their average eight year period of incarceration. Prisoners could hear the sounds of the city. From one of the cells, it was possible to see San Francisco and know the life so close but not available. Prisoners would spend an average of eight years in a very small cell, and most of the time the prisoners came from other federal penitentiaries to perhaps be sent to yet another prison after spending time here. Very few prisoners were actually released from here, some spending more than 25 years on Alcatraz. You couldn't escape from Alcatraz. All of the 36 prisoners who tried to escape were recaptured within an hour, except for five who were reported as missing. It is assumed that they died, drowning in the strong currents and the icy waters of the bay. Among the more than 1,500 prisoners, Al Capone, George Machine Gun Kelly, and Robert Strout, convicted of homicide, came through the prison during its 29 years. In the 1960s, public opinion started to be concerned about the harshness of the prison conditions. In addition, the high costs of running this island prison ultimately led to its closure in 1963. In 1969, a group of Native Americans occupied the abandoned island for two years. Later, Alcatraz was granted to the city of San Francisco, which has taken on the responsibility for restoring certain buildings while also opening up the island to visitors. To visit Alcatraz, it's recommended to reserve tickets a few days in advance. The modest costs can vary depending on whether you want a guided tour or not. You can easily spend the day on the island, there are ferry services from morning to late afternoon. However, please don't miss your return boat. A night spent between the walls of Alcatraz might prove to be uncomfortable. Taking a glance at the prison facilities, here is the main security office and the communications center. A typical cell looked like that, a prison bunk and very few other comforts and truly little space to stretch out. Talking about stretching out, there's the prisoner's recreation area, the dining room. It was said that one ate well there and that there was abundant food. Alcatraz, a name that made criminals tremble, a place prominent in the imagination of the American people. An island of historic significance, but never completely welcoming. Even though we try to have you live the great adventures of the Americas with new and unusual experiences, it would have been odd not to spend a little time with the cable cars. 
Let's start by saying that this mode of transportation is extremely popular with the tourists. Everyone wants to enjoy riding a cable car. And we have to keep in mind that everyone is the millions of tourists each year. The cable cars in themselves offer little comfort about them, but you can quickly forgive this lack of comfort because what better way is there to take in the city's bent, hilly streets? There's a great example of the feeling you get riding a cable car. The neighborhoods go by one after another, and San Francisco won't have any secrets left to hide after we've ridden the whole line, a jaunt that takes about 30 minutes. Unless you're like us, and get off and on in order to ride three different cars. Casually watching the conductor, his job appears to be rather physically demanding. You will find the Cable Car Museum in the Knob Hill neighborhood. This museum tells the story of the cable cars, this hearty servant of the community. You can choose to get on or off wherever you like, and touring San Francisco this way guarantees you a very pleasant time. That's something you have to do, an experience you have to try when you come to San Francisco. The famous cable cars, which have been there for decades and are truly a great way to tour the city, while walking is pleasant, riding the cable cars truly adds to your stay in the city of San Francisco. But when you're in Northern California, remember that there's Sacramento. Remember that you can go see Berkeley. Remember the numerous beautiful places to visit as a family or on your own and truly explore this gorgeous region of California. <laughs>